My name is Christian Heal. I'm a, a research fellow at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. This apparently works better if you turn it on. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christian Heal. I'm a research fellow at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, and I'm a colleague of Professor Givens. It's a um, great pleasure to welcome you today. This is the third in a series of four lectures by Professor Givens under the general title of The Choice to Believe. The series began with lectures entitled The Doors of Faith and Awful Woundedness. If you didn't have a chance to attend those lectures or simply want to watch them again, I've heard they're very good date night uh, lectures. <laughs> um, you can find them on the Maxwell Institute uh, website or on the Maxwell Institute YouTube page. The last lecture of the series, entitled Worlds Without End, will be delivered here on December the 9th. As we prepare for today's lecture, um, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. We'll, we will begin with a prayer, but before we do, let me take a brief moment to introduce our speaker. Professor Givens has the kind of academic biography that you'd expect from someone whose lectures are sponsored by that many organizations. <laughs> he began his career here, of course, leaving a uh, receiving a wonderful undergraduate education and then went on to graduate school at Cornell and UNC. He ended the first part of his academic career as professor of literature and religion at the University of Richmond, where he held the James A. Bostwick Chair in English. In June of this year, it was our pleasure to welcome Terrell Givens as, a, as the Neil A. Maxwell Senior Research Fellow at the Maxwell Institute here at BYU. I suspect, however, what brought Professor Givens here is less um, uh, predictable. I suspect it began with a series of promptings. I suspect it included an act of consecration and a desire to serve and to minister. And it's, it's that that we want to hear, that side of Professor Givens that we came here to, to hear today. Becca Driggs has kindly agreed to give the opening prayer. And after that, it will be our pleasure to hear from Professor Givens. At the end of the lecture, he'll be pleased to uh, take a few questions as well. So, Becca Driggs. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here together today to listen to the words prepared by Brother Givens. Um, please help us to feel of his spirit and of thy spirit as we talk about the plan of happiness and the choice to believe. And we're grateful for the gospel and for the peace um, and the, the knowledge that it brings to our lives. And um, please help us throughout the rest of our day that we can have thy spirit with us and help others to also make the choice to believe. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here again um, for this, which may begin to start feeling like a marathon to some of you. Um, I want to start with a with an, a clarification. A um, an announcement went out to some parties from our from the Maxwell office. And there was a typo. There was a B somehow inserted in the announcement, and it said Professor Givens will be speaking on the Great Plan B of Happiness. <laughs> and I just want to make sure you understand that that was the other guys. Um, so, so I'm talking today on the great plan A of, of happiness. And I hope to make two principal claims today. Uh, first, and, and these, are, these are claims that I, I think, if properly understood, really help to differentiate us more radically, and I think resonantly, from mainstream Christian history. But the first clarification, I think, to the, to the Christian story is that we believe life is an educative ascent and not a catastrophic fall. 
And second, we preach a Christ who is our healer from woundedness and not our rescuer from depravity. Perhaps not surprisingly, it was for Latter-day Saint women of the 19th century to first realize how drastically the Restoration rewrote the founding narrative of Western civilization. An entirely typical traditional Christian account of the fall, and this is coming from a fairly standard textbook in the field, relates that, quote, the story immediately unfolds with a catastrophe. Evil follows evil like an avalanche. As a consequence, wrote Augustine, the principal founder of creedal Christianity, humanity became one mass of sin. One of the first women with a great insight to challenge that view was the LDS Relief Society president, Sarah Kimball, who wrote in 1874, our great maternal progenitor is entitled to reverent honor for braving the peril that brought Earth's children from the dark valley of ignorance and stagnation and placed them on the broad progressive plain where they, knowing good and evil, joy and sorrow, may become gods. Mother Eve, for taking the initiative in this advanced movement, should receive encomiums of praise. Now that is the upside of LDS theology. The fall was no fall but ascent. The human family is ushered into life by the courageous choice of Eve the heroine, not by the wicked weakness of Eve the sinner. Life is an upper division course in gradual sanctification, not a purgatory of inherited sin. And we Latter-day Saints are optimists. God, said Joseph Smith, will ferret out every soul that can be saved. We believe in heavenly parents who want peers, not subjects, and we have the confidence that they, God jointly, will bring us to where they are. The other side of the coin, however, is that our optimistic LDS culture has at times made the path there look misleadingly simple. Our faith tradition aspires to make us into God's own likeness, divine beings in our own right, and then unite us in an endless community of the sanctified. Our sin as saints is in thinking that such an endeavor could be anything other than wrenching and costly, inconceivably difficult, and unimaginably painful. As I've said in other contexts, we do not become little Christs by a couple of well-spent hours ministering to our families and abstaining from tea and coffee. If we remember this principle, it can reshape our understanding of just what the purpose of the church its principles and its institutional forms is. And it turns out this purpose may be close to the opposite of what we had thought. Let me share the best sermon ever given to shake us out of our misleading paradigms in this regard. That was Mother Eve. The Gospel, said Brigham Young, causes men and women to reveal that which would have slept in their dispositions until they dropped into their graves. The plan by which the Lord leads this people makes them reveal their thoughts and intents and brings out every train of disposition lurking in their beings. Every fault that a person has will be made manifest in order that it may be corrected by the gospel of salvation. So you see, in this, in this account, the point of the gospel is to keep us in a perpetual state of dis-ease, and disequilibrium, forcing to the surface every flaw that our biology, our environment, and our own spiritual immaturity bring in their wake. That is the grand design behind the project. Evolution in spiritual things as well as in biological organisms is powered by tension, contestation, and friction. These are the only conditions under which such sanctifying can take place. Contemporary research in the social sciences bears unexpected witness to this fact. A few years ago, Malcolm Gladwell popularized the 10,000-hour principle. Play chess for 10,000 hours and you'll be a grandmaster. Play music in European dives for 10,000 hours and you can be the next Beatles. So will 10,000 hour, hours of practice make you a saint? Well, David Epstein wrote a brilliant corrective to Gladwell's book called Range. Let me share a few of his findings, as I think several of them have eternal significance. Epstein divides the world into two kinds of domains that he calls wicked 
and kind. A kind domain is one in which the rules are clear, the variables are limited, scenarios are fairly predictable, like tennis or golf or chess or playing guitar. He notes that pretending the world is like golf and chess is comforting. It makes for a tidy, kind world message and some very compelling books. But the other domain is what he calls a wicked domain. And he means this in the sense of devilishly challenging, not evil. In wicked domains, he writes, or in what he calls a, a wicked domain, the rules of the game are often unclear or incomplete. There may or may not be repetitive patterns, and they may not be obvious, and feedback is often delayed, inaccurate, or both. And here's his bottom line. When we know the rules and the answers, and they don't change over time, chess, golf, playing classical music, we fall into the trap that he calls cognitive entrenchment. Those who expose themselves to wicked domains, by contrast, become what he calls successful adapters. They draw on outside experience and analogies to, in, in, to, to interrupt their inclination toward a previous solution that may no longer work. Much of his book is an advertisement for wicked domains, range, breadth, challenging environments, diversity of experience and education are the keys to flourishing. But I want to zero in on the phenomenal relevance of these two principles that he has denominated cognitive entrenchment and successful adaptation in particular. Because with these two terms, I think we find a powerful vocabulary for why some saints flourish in the midst of life's challenges, while others dwindle in unbelief. These are the only two options before you. They were the only two options open to Adam and Eve. You find a place of comfort and security and you stay there, safe but in stasis, happy but fragile. Or you make the choice to enter a fraught field of dissonance and uncertainty and you adapt creatively as you go along. This applies with special force to faith and to testimony. A testimony is a paradigm. You have a comprehensive schema for making sense of life. It consists of a set of principles and rules and expectations they include your deeply held beliefs about the nature of revelation, the role and character of prophets, the reliability of scripture, what it means to call a church true or to know God lives. And then a few steps outside the garden, catastrophe strikes. Revelation fails you, prophets err, scripture manifests inconsistencies, the institution shows its flaws, and God is silent in the face of your personal tragedies. So what do you do? Eighty years ago, the moral philosopher A.D. Lindsay said this about true principles. They see the situation and say, here is a mess, a crying need, an evil. What can you do about it? We are not asked to say yes or no, I will or I will not, but to be inventive, to create, to discover something new. This is still Lindsay writing. The difference between ordinary people and saints is not that saints fulfill the plain duties which ordinary men neglect. The things saints do and think have not usually occurred to ordinary people at all. This process is like the work of the artist. It needs imagination and spontaneity. It is not a choice between presented alternatives, but the creation of something new. The creation of something new. I love and admire this vision of Lindsay because he sees the life of faith and of discipleship as a moral and intellectual adventure. A testimony, the paradigm by which you live your life and decipher its meaning, must be continually rebuilt with every new morning. Some have criticized testimony adjustment as mental gymnastics. Is reconstituting a paradigm or a testimony in the light of new information a virtuoso performance of intellectual agility? Well, of course it is. And I hope you are engaging in perpetual mental calisthenics yourself, because the alternative is mental timidity and sloth, or what, what uh, Epstein called cognitive entrenchment, being trapped by our own presuppositions. Perhaps we should adopt the attitude of the great Catholic Cardinal John Henry Newman. 10,000 difficulties do not add up to a doubt. Or the great Anglican theologian Austin Ferrer, who wrote, 
I shall not call my faith in doubt, for since God has shown to me a ray of his goodness, I cannot doubt him on the ground that someone has made up some new logical puzzle about him. It is too late in the day to tell me that God does not exist, the God with whom I have so long conversed, and whom I have seen active in several men and women of real sanctity. And then he adds this observation. But there must be much in our teaching of Christianity and our living of it which is at fault if good people react in total disbelief of it. Our paths to discipleship, in other words, must be individuated. They must be the product of a strenuously achieved personal understanding, not an effortless embrace of a template. Now, David Bentley Hart is something of an iconoclast. He has been called the preeminent theologian in the English-speaking world. And he makes this very unsettling claim about the New Testament. In a sense, the good news announced by Scripture was that Jesus Christ had come to save humanity from the burden of Christianity. Now, to what burdens of Christianity is he referring, and do we find similar burdens in the Church of Jesus Christ? If we turn to the first crisis in the primitive church, we find the early controversies in the church in Palestine rooted in this very dilemma. What practices were authentically Christian? And which elements were simply cultural inheritance, assumptions and expectations, that is, burdens imposed from without? In the book of Acts, we read of a great dissension that broke out on this question as that small Galilean sect first began its long progress to becoming a global religion. You were not Christians after the manner of Moses, some of the old crowd protested, regarding foreign converts with deep-seated suspicion as they were not observers of the Jewish law. Peter's admonition to his fellow apostles and elders still rings true and relevant today. Now, therefore, why put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. As Brigham Young declared, away with stereotyped Mormons. Don't let the expectations of others become a yoke on your neck. Internalize and authenticate your religious commitments. May I adapt Hart's provocation to our own predicament? If we read Mark's manual of discipleship, also called his gospel, we find a recurrent theme. Now watch how it unfolds. The first verses are set in the wilderness. The first chapter ends in the desert places. In chapter 6, he tells his apostles, come ye apart into a desert place. When he heals one who is deaf a few chapters later, he took him aside from the multitude. In chapter 8, the crowd bring a blind man unto him, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. In chapter 9, he takes Peter, James, and John apart from themselves. Do you think you have caught the motif? We serve and we worship in community, but we come closest to the Holy of Holies as individuals. The point seems to be, as my wife Fiona is fond of saying, of course the path to divinization is narrow. It only admits one, and that one is you. How do we fashion that path? Well, may I make three suggestions today. First, I think we need to embrace the challenge of a life of strenuous spiritual endeavor in a spirit of teachability. Welcome challenges to your faith as an opportunity to reshape your understanding of God, his nature, and his activity in the universe. Be as open to wonderment and teachability as Moses was, who confronted with a vision of the universe that totally annihilated his paradigm was glad to learn things I never had supposed. Be as adaptable as Joseph Smith, who learning a new truth about God's capacious heaven, confessed that he marveled at what he saw and who he saw there. Don't be cognitively entrenched, as so many are when confronted with a challenge like the Book of Abraham, a stumbling block to many in the faith. Why? Because it disrupts our expectations of how the revelatory process should work. Consider instead the example of the Apostle Paul, who having a visionary experience was unsure of what he was even experiencing. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. His confession is telling. For those open to the divine voice, God speaks through manifold means, which often surprise and confound us. Through the voice of another or in the still small voice only you can hear. 
in waking visions and through dreams in the night. Scriptures unfold themselves to us as we liken them to ourselves, and a prophet's words may pierce our heart as if heaven sent and aimed. Prophets find themselves visited in a sacred grove like Adam in the garden, where they may seek understanding through study and prayer and linguistic application. Despite his efforts, Joseph Smith could not create a grammar of Egyptian, but his efforts to do so are nothing if not impressive. At the end of his years of wrestling to decipher ancient manuscripts, he produced a text through means he may not himself have fully understood any more than Paul's visionary. This is a deal breaker for some in the faith community. That is, to my mind, unfortunate. God dwells in everlasting burnings. Job's presumption to fit God's behavior into tidy, predictable categories was personally catastrophic. And Moses was left to marvel at his finitude before the infinitude of the cosmos and its creator. In our suspicion of creedal irrationality, we as saints have perhaps diminished God's majesty by our glib familiarity and thought to tame and domesticate his blinding light into a non-threatening candle. I want to be comfortable in a tradition where the novel and the unexpected and the indecipherable can still erupt. And I cannot help but admire Joseph Smith's insatiable appetite in his attempt to penetrate the veils of heaven and of history, the intellectual and spiritual energies with which he pursued his task, and his indifference to the uneven results of his own ongoing yet ever incomplete explorations. We want our religious narratives to be simple and straightforward but God's workings invariably disappoint such ex expectations. There may be an apt corollary in modern science. As physicists and cosmologists have probed both the wider cosmos and the subatomic realms, we find that reality defies familiar assumptions at every turn. Quantum theory, for example, reveals that nature at its most fundamental level is, quote, absurd from the point of view of common sense, according to Richard Feynman. Matter consists of waves, unless you measure for particles. But if you measure for waves, we're back to waves. As John Gribben writes, we really don't even know what matter is. It will appear as either a wave or particle depending on what measurements you use. In the world of the very small, things do not behave in any way that we can understand from our experience of the everyday world. He writes, all pictures are false, and there is no physical analogy we can make to understand what goes on. Gary Zukov makes such weirdness even stranger. According to quantum physics, he writes, a subatomic particle is not really a particle. Rather, particles are tendencies to exist. They have no objective existence. And you thought religion was tough. <laughs> As an article in Forbes summarizes, physicists now reject three foundational ideas about our universe, three common sense understandings. Locality, the idea that an event in one place cannot simultaneously affect an event in another. Reality that the universe and its elements exist independently of our observation, and determinism, the law of causality, that all effects are determined by causes. These three ideas, I repeat, foundational ideas at the very heart of any common sense understanding of the world are now contested by virtually all physicists. New paradigms striving to make new sense of our world include string theory with its 11 dimensions and the multiverse positing an infinite number of entire, of entire universes with infinite iterations of you. Hugh Everett postulates famously that every time we make a measurement, the entire universe splits in twain. Both universes are now equally real, but we are forced by the process of observation to select one of these alternatives, which becomes part of what we see as the real world. It gets worse, <laughs> or better if you like Kafka. At a, at a deeper level, there, be, there may be no such thing as place and no such thing as distance, writes George Musser. And quantum theorist Carlo Rovelli notes how there is no single time for different places. There is no special moment on any other planet that corresponds to what constitutes the here and now for us. Simultaneity does not exist. Newton's universe, once stable, coherent, and predictable, has become foreign, indecipherable, and saturated in mystery and paradox. As John Wheeler summarizes, all these problems involving the deeper reality behind appearances are outside our normal language. Since basics as foundational as space and time and matter continue to thwart the greatest minds in the human race, it hardly seems reasonable to expect that our transactions with the divine 
should be more predictable and straightforward, fitting into neat categories and expectations. How naive and presumptuous to insist that while our universe in its deepest structure is beyond our modes of either visualization or comprehension, God and his workings should not be. Perhaps authentic encounters with the divine will always be disruptive of both our expectations and our paradigms. The German Helmut von Moltke famously wrote, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, nor does a testimony forged without fire survive first contact with the forces of entropy and chaos that assault us outside the walls of Eden. That is the point. Only the suffering and skepticism and cognitive dissonance we encounter in a fallen world can provide the fiery catalyst to propel us out of our cognitive entrenchment and force us to employ all of our spiritual and intellectual resources to open our hearts and minds to a truth that always eludes our perfect comprehension. To return again to Mark, in chapter 8 we witness a peculiar instance of the healing of the blind man whom Christ has led out of the town. Jesus spits on his hands, places them on the man's face, and asks, do you see anything? To which an undoubtedly disappointed patient replies, I see men as trees walking. What are we to make of this? Has the great physician and healer failed? Jesus repeats the procedure, and this time the healing takes. He saw every man clearly. What a powerful principle Mark has just taught us about the path of discipleship. We only see the full picture incrementally, as our vision only gradually keeps pace with a great revelation. Note well, please note, that even after the Master's first touch, the blind man saw imperfectly. But because he did not turn in disappointment from the healer, his capacity to see grew measure by measure. My second suggestion. Recognize the interdependence of your discipleship. We are all interdependent in ways we don't even fathom. For starters, because our very personhood remains incomplete and cannot flourish in solitary condition. When I was a child, year after year I asked for an ant farm. And year after year my parents complied. I anxiously ran outside, scooped up a cupful of ants from the desert's abundant ant hills, placed them in a plastic cubicle and watched them slowly die. This experience deeply scarred me <laughs> and shaped my conception of a tragic universe. Ants can only function in community. In isolation, they not only fail to thrive, they die. Psychologists and social workers know the cost of human isolation. But only the restoration elevates social fact to theological principle. An exalted being is dual, consisting of two unified, sanctified individuals. Sanctification is a communal affair. There is no Zion individual. We are, as Aristophanes intuited, semi-beings apart from the condition of belonging. We may not realize that we have greater powers to assist and to hinder each other in our heavenward aspirations than we know. One of the most astonishing things Joseph Smith said about the celestial kingdom is this. If you do not accuse each other, God will not accuse you. If you have no accuser, you will enter heaven. Now, if you take him at his word, this is a terrifying prospect. <laughs> right? He's said, not only must we forgive all offenders to participate in heaven, we must be forgiven by all those whom we have offended. All those who have taken offense at our words or deeds, whether deliberate or not. That hardly seems fair but it's based on a peculiarly Latter-day Saint understanding of heaven. Someone's refusal to forgive me impedes our relationship and in that way constrains my heaven as well as hers. Worthiness is not or not the only criterion for celestial life. Through our choices every day we construct or delimit the heaven that others will or will not enjoy. That may be why the words of the greatest historical novelist of our era have particular force for me. Some live all their lives without discovering this truth, that the noblest and most terrible power that we possess is the power we have each one of us over the chance met, the stranger, 
the passerby outside your life and your kin. Speak, she said, as you would write, as if your words were letters of lead graven there for all time, for which you must take the consequences, and then take the consequences. My third challenge, be spiritually resourceful, or what I would like to call spiritually entrepreneurial. Build a more ample library of scripture, treasuring those voices in the wilderness, holy men and women that the Lord told us we know not of. Articulate your own moral code, not diminishing, but extrapolating from revealed truth. Here's one that I try to live by that comes from John Wesley's mother. She said to her sons, take this rule, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tendency of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things. That is sin to you, however innocent it may be in itself. This helps me to remember the counsel of the great preacher John Smith, who said, that which enables us to know and understand aright the things of God must be a living principle of holiness within us. Divine truth is better understood as it, as it unfolds itself in the purity of men's hearts and lives than in all those subtle niceties into which curious wits may lay it forth. Some men have too bad hearts to have too good heads. He that will find truth must seek it with free judgment and with a sanctified mind. Now, I hope the story of the blind man discussed above helps us segue to my second major topic today. What does it mean to see Jesus Christ as our healer, and how do we find access to this healing power? This is a topic to which Fiona and I have devoted considerable effort in recent months and years. I said in my last remarks in this setting that Thomas knew Christ by his wounds, as Christ knows us by ours, and we all have them. As the philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff has written, we all suffer, for we all prize and love. And in this present existence of ours, prizing and loving yields suffering. Love in our world is always suffering love. Some do not suffer much, for they do not love much. Suffering is for the loving. We know that we can lift each other in our pain, but Christ cannot lift us out of ours if he is just a theological construct. Does theology matter? Yes, for the simple reason that a correct theology is more conducive to a vital faith than an incorrect theology. Irenaeus, before darkness overtook the Christian understanding of God, referred to Christianity as the only true and life-giving church. I love that expression, which we could read as a gloss on our scriptural version of only true church, because it emphasizes what our faith, if accurately articulated, is capable of doing. Let me give three examples of how theology matters, how it can prepare the ground for us to move from Christ as theological construct to Christ as life-giving and life-healing physician. Let me preface them with an illustration taken from a contemporary study of human motivation and human trust. Matthew Ridley describes experiments conducted with students employing the prisoner's dilemma game. Most of you are familiar with that game in which each player must decide whether to cooperate in the hope of mutual gain or defect in the hope of selfish gain. Here was the most alarming fact drawn from that study. Economic students, and I was assured there wouldn't be any in this lecture, so I think this is safe. <laughs> Economic students who have been taught the self-interested nature of human beings are twice as likely to defect, breaking faith and the hopes of personal gain. Now, my point is not to cast aspersions on the character of any particular major, but the point is that they have been trained and versed in the self-interested nature of human beings, and thus they are twice as likely to be mistrustful themselves. Ridley's point is that we can, be expect, we can be trained to expect certain things of our fellow human beings. And what we believe to be true of our own deepest nature and what we believe to be true of God's nature has real world consequences. That is why theology matters. The finer points of our beliefs matter. 
who we are, why we are here, what our destiny is, what factors are conducive to our fullest thriving, and what kind of being presides over our lives. The form we give such conceptions has a profound and at times measurable impact on the nature of our human relationships, our interactions, our capacity to engage meaningfully in the world's work of healing. So here are three restoration teachings that are life-giving. They are redefinitions of the fall of sin and of atonement that I would propose. First, as I indicated briefly at the outset, we tell a different story about the garden. We do not believe human life began with a catastrophe or that humanity is a seething mass of sin. We have a different account, which the Eastern Fathers outside the circle of Augustine's influence recognized. In this version, quote, the inheritance of the fall is an inheritance of mortality, not of sinfulness. Sinfulness merely being a consequence of mortality. It is the collateral damage that we experience and inflict in learning to prize the good and the sweet that harm arises. As the philosopher Charles Taylor wrote, Charles Taylor is, sorry for skipping over those, that's Dorothy Dunnett and uh, Walter Storff. And why am I not there? I'm looking for Charles, oh, that's Charles Taylor, beg your pardon. Uh, brilliant, brilliant philosopher, wrote one of the most impactful works in probably the last half century. He has what I think is one of the most inspired definitions of sin that I've ever read. He says, sin is our resistance to going along with God's initiative in making suffering reparative. And Dorothy Sayer says something quite similar. The perfect work of love demands the cooperation of the creature. So this suggests, in turn, a different conception of atonement that I think we have yet to grasp. If we trace briefly the history of the word, we can learn what we have lost. Working in the 14th century, the Englishman John Wycliffe was determined that every boy at the plow should be able to read the Bible in his native tongue, so he embarked on the first English translation of the Bible. Coming to Romans chapter 5, he came to the culminating work of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, which he expressed in this language. We glory in God by our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received reconciling. The gift of Christ in his language is reconciliation to God, a coming to complete harmony and unity and love and healing. This was the sum total of Jesus Christ's great work effected in Gethsemane and on the cross. It was a few centuries later that William Tyndale, retranslating the same verse, introduced into Holy Writ the word atonement. We have received by Jesus Christ the atonement. So here's what we have lost. That word atonement was cognate with another word that the great mystic Julian of Norwich had used a century earlier, in which I wish both of these translators had used. Seen in vision the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, she wrote of her sorrow to see that body in pain that is loved. But in that shared suffering, I saw a great oneing, a great oneing between Christ and us. In the broader Christian tradition, atonement came fairly quickly to signify the payment of a debt, suffering or pain undergone to rectify a past wrong, compensation or restitution. These ideas have become part of the theological heritage of a concept central to Christian understanding. However, it would be tragic if the mechanism by which the atonement is carried out were to displace in our minds the effect it was meant to achieve. The word in its original usage does not describe something Christ did, but something he hopes to achieve. Atonement should not serve primarily as a description of his heroic sacrifice, but as a description of the product, the outcome of that sacrifice. The atonement is not a legal one, having reference to reparation or ransom or payment, but as Julian's related term suggests, it is ontological. It refers to a relationship that the sacrifice is meant to accomplish. As Julian imagines the words of Jesus speaking to her, I shall gather you and make you mild and meek, clean and holy by wanting you to me. We have to do our part to bring the process to fruition by accepting, embracing, and by redirecting our desires and affections. 
Let me conclude with an explanation for why Fiona and I prefer to understand Christ as our healer, at least in conjunction with, if not instead of, our Savior. I'll give you three reasons. First, as we saw earlier, Nephi had learned in the vision of the angel that the principal condition of our mortal state is woundedness, not sinfulness. Second, because in the Greek Testament, in the New Testament, the Greek word sozo is employed over and over and over again to describe the act of healing, of making whole, of making well. It is used in the stories of Jesus healing the blind, the lame, the possessed, the diseased, and even the dead. But note well, those are more examples. In all of these, the Greek word is sozo. But note well what happens to that word in these three different instances. In these three stories told by Mark, Matthew, and Luke, three stories of healing, we find the identical Greek phrase, identical Greek phrase in identical contexts. And in the King James Version, the first one reads, your faith has healed you. And the second one, your faith has, excuse me, thy faith hath made thee whole, thy faith hath made thee whole. And then in the third case, thy faith hath saved thee. Now, why saved? Why do we suddenly divert from the, the, the definition, the translation, which is so clearly inevitable in these other cases? And, and how much weight should we attribute to that sleight of hand? Why saved? Because in this case, in the third case, Christ is healing a woman who had sinned. What is Luke's point? Well, it seems perfectly clear to me, sinning needs healing just as much as other forms of spiritual and emotional harm. But instead, the translators jump to the Calvinist default, that sin is an evil leading to a hell from which we must be saved. And that, in turn, becomes the default setting of the Christian world. The emphasis on sin and salvation over brokenness, woundedness, and healing. What a beautiful insight we have lost into the act of divine forgiveness as a gesture of holy healing conducive of at one -ment. I believe the clear textual evidence and restoration scripture and pronouncements alike urge a corrective. And we heard one version of this from Elder Rendland when he characterized Jesus as the good shepherd who is helping us all progress toward healing. I prefer to see Jesus Christ as my healer because saving and salvation are such cold impersonal and abstract ideas. In Christ's healing ministry, we see his personal touch time and time again. As Thomas felt the Christ's wounds, so did Christ feel those of the lame and the blind and the afflicted of every sort, and so does he feel ours. It is my faith that rooted in these restored truths about the purpose behind our mortal sojourn and the true nature and healing role of Jesus Christ we can be more deeply motivated to accept his invitation, to be one with him and bring his work of at one to completion. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.